Good evening, everyone. Welcome to series 109 of the Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Priya Pais, who is the Associate Professor of Pediatric Nephrology at the St. John's Medical College in Bangalore, India. That is also where she completed her undergraduate training and then did her internship at the Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. And that was followed by a residency at the Wisconsin Children's Hospital in Milwaukee. And then she did her fellowship and embassy at the Northwestern University Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. She is a well-accomplished academic with several publications in peer-reviewed journals, and she's written five chapters in the textbook of pediatric nephrology. She's also an affiliate of the Indian Pediatric Nephrology Association Sister Care Committee and the International Pediatric Transplant Association Outreach Committee. She has before had one excellent talk with us on the management of pediatric reflux nephropathy, and I hope this is the second of many more to come. With that, Dr. Priya, please accept our warm welcome, and we are really looking forward to your talk to the approach of, to hypertensive crisis in children. Thank you very much, Dr. Amar, for that kind introduction, and thank you, um, Dr. Lloyd and the Africa Healthcare Network for giving me this uh, second opportunity to be with um, you all. I'm going to be discussing um, an approach to a child with hypertensive crisis. And this is really um, a practical guide to evaluation and management. And I would um, really like to hear from you all and compare notes as we all practice in uh, low resource settings and often don't have access to all the medications um, that I guess Western pediatric nephrology guidelines suggest. So. So I'll begin, as we often do, with a case which we see quite often in our ER. This was a 10-year-old boy with a history of a generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and he had no um, history of seizures in the past and no history of recent fever to make us think of meningitis. On general examination, he was drowsy, but otherwise had a normal GCS and responded to simple commands. His blood pressure is, um, was 130 by 88 when taken with an adult-sized cup. His blood glucose was normal. He had no meningeal signs, no focal neurological deficits. And um, while his labs were being drawn, the child had another seizure. And this time, his blood pressure on the um, oscillometric monitor was 150 by 100. So the question to... Um, everyone to spark a thought process and discussion is how would you evaluate and manage this patient? So the specific learning objectives for our um, chat today are to define hypertensive crisis in children and to discuss a practical approach to the rapid assessment and stabilization, um, how to initiate antihypertensive therapy, to formulate a differential diagnosis and to begin a relevant evaluation. I'll also be discussing the pathophysiology and applied aspects of hypertensive encephalopathy. And if we have time, then to discuss some cases. So the definition of hypertension and its severity in children is important to know, though it is a little more cumbersome for children than it is for adults, because of course, children um, have normal blood pressure values that differ by their um, sex as well as by their age and height. So, um, According to the 2017 American Academy of Pediatrics Clinical Practice Guidelines, um, they divide children into less 12 years and younger and 13 and older. And the 13 and older age group, hypertension is defined just like in adults um, as BP greater than 130 by 80. In children who are younger than 13 years, uh, hypertension is defined as a systolic or a diastolic BP greater than the 95th centile of the new normative blood pressure chart. So the severity of hypertension, I'm sure you are all familiar with, is uh, divided into normal blood pressure, elevated BP, stage one hypertension, and stage two hypertension. And if we were just to focus on stage one and stage two hypertension as the staging of severity of hypertension, um, stage one hypertension is defined as a blood pressure that is between the 95th to the 12 millimeters above the 95th percentile based on age, um, sex, and height. In 13 years and older, a blood pressure between 130 to 140 systolic and 80 to 90 diastolic is considered stage one. And the highest stage or stage two 
uh, hypertension is any blood pressure above 12 millimeters greater than the 95th centile or above 140 by 90. So what is a hypertensive crisis? So this is much um, more definitively defined in adults. So we'll borrow the definition from adult first. So a hypertensive crisis, according to the JNC7, is a blood pressure that is greater than 180 millimeters of mercury systolic and or greater than 120 millimeters of mercury diastolic. And a hypertensive crisis thus is a severely elevated blood pressure. So any patient with severe hypertension, if they have life-threatening end organ damage is said to have a hypertensive emergency. And a hypertensive urgency is, of course, anyone who has severely elevated blood pressure without severe end organ damage. Yeah. So what is the end organ damage and the clinical presentation of hypertensive emergencies in adults? As you are more familiar with this than I am, they range, they're quite variable. They range from um, symptoms occurring in pregnant women, eclampsia, severe eclampsia, HELP syndrome. They can present with AKI, hypertensive encephalopathy, intracerebral hemorrhage, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, um, acute left ventricular failure with pulmonary edema, acute myocardial infarction, and pulmonary edema with respiratory failure. So the two Clinical presentations that I've underlined in orange are those that we uh, will find in children. So what about the definition of a hypertensive crisis in children? So a hypertensive crisis is defined according um, to pediatric um, hypertensive guidelines as an acute episode of severely elevated blood pressure with potential for end organ damage. There are no specific cutoff values of BP. But usually the blood pressure is great, at least a stage two in severity. So if we look at this algorithm, I, I begun the algorithm with secondary hypertension. And this is to really stress on the fact that even though older adolescents or obese children may be diagnosed with primary hypertension, primary hypertension in children does not present with a hypertensive crisis. So invariably, a hypertensive crisis in children is because of a secondary cause of hypertension, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So um, if a child has life-threatening symptoms or end organ damage, they have a hypertensive emergency. A hypertensive urgency could be when symptoms are less severe without end organ damage. So if we were to um, look at the main points or the caveats of hypertensive crisis in children, a hypertensive crisis is a clinical diagnosis. It is caused by the rapid rise of BP, and it is the rapidity of rise that leads to severe symptoms. The symptoms are actually more important. The presence of symptoms indicates a hypertensive urgency or emergency, not the actual absolute BP value, because children are inherently assumed to have a normal blood pressure or around the 50th centile. So therefore, if the BP even was, you know, above the 95th centile, that could be a significant rise from their previous baseline and give rise to symptoms. Um, the difference between an emergency and an urgency really is arbitrary. It depends on the physician's clinical judgment as to what is a severe symptom or a less severe symptom. Um, is there a better term? Yes. And so a better terminology as suggested by recent guidelines is instead of hypertensive crisis to call it acute severe hypertension with or without symptoms. So let's switch tracks to a practical approach to a child with a hypertensive crisis, how to do a rapid assessment and stabilization. So the first thing is to assess this, whether there are symptoms and signs and therefore confirm whether there is a hypertensive emergency. The second is to stabilize the patient and to begin some basic practical important orders. Next would be to do a correct BP measurement, which as you can imagine is more difficult in children than it is in adults to get an accurate value. To ask five key questions to begin the evaluation for the cause, because these kids all have secondary hypertension. Uh, a simple thing that can be done is to do a fundus examination, because this really tells us um, if there are hypertensive changes in the eye, this is likely to be a hypertensive emergency. 
and to begin antihypertensive medications and a plan BP reduction. And we'll go over these in some detail. So this table just summarizes in the signs and symptoms in children. And as you can see, the central nervous system is the most often affected. And okay. children can present with symptoms as um, mild as the headache, going on to nausea, vomiting, altered sensorium, seizures, Focal deficits are rare, but do occur, all the way up to cortical blindness. The eye symptoms do occur. Um, they can present as blurry vision. They can be papilledema, retinal hemorrhages, and exudates. And of course, this requires a good fundus examination. Um, pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure are much less common in children compared to the CNS symptoms. So if we were to look at our one of our sample order sheets of a child who presents with hypertension and seizures, uh, of course, airway and breathing needs to be supported. And if the child requires intubation, most commonly for a low GCS, then it's important to remember for a rapid sequence intubation to avoid ketamine because this worsens the hypertension. If they're having seizures, as per protocol, lorazepam injections, can be given to stop the seizures, rapid placement of two IV lines would be very helpful, at least one, and um, two if you are planning to give IV antihypertensive medications. The initial labs to be sent are really very simple. A blood gas, if available, um, doing a quick blood glucose check, and of course, urea, creatinine, electrolytes, and difficult to do and often forgotten, a urine sample. Uh, blood pressure measurements should be frequent. Um, and if you have an oscillometric machine, this is very helpful. And very important in children, keeping in mind secondary causes of hypertension is to check lower limb pulses and to get lower limb blood pressures. Um, because in children, coarctation, especially in young children or infants, is possible. And also, um, Takayasu arthritis is something that we see quite regularly. If you have a friend from ophthalmology, then a stat fundus examination would be useful, especially in the older child. And if there are seizures or if there's a history of trauma, getting a quick brain CT to rule out um, an intracranial cause for hypertension, a sign of raised intracranial hypertension, because this would be a contraindication to lowering the BP quickly. This is just to bring to your notice that in the late 2017 AAP um, clinical practice guidelines, there is a simplified BP table because um, as we discussed, BP, um, you know, as deciding what's normal and abnormal in children of different ages looks a little complicated. So there is a simplified BP table which can be stuck on an emergency room wall and if the blood pressure is, it presents basically the 90th centile as a screening. And it, it has the age of the child, the sex, and it has a series of BP, single BP values by age. And if the blood pressure that you get for the patient is greater than the value that's put in the simplified BP table, then one would ensure that um, you do repeat BP measurements to confirm that there is hypertension or not. Confirming hypertension is important. Um, and of course, in a clinic or office practice, one would have a seated, calm child, which is not going to happen in a child who's in an emergency room. But to the best of our ability, we try and make sure that the BP, the sigma manometer is at the level of the heart. Um, and most importantly, really, is that the correct sized cuff is used. And if you look at this diagram, you can see that it's the width of the cuff should be at least 40% of the mid-arm circumference. Um, a cuff that is too small gives an artificially high blood pressure reading. If one has to err on the size of the cuff that has to be used, a bigger cuff is less um, likely to give a, an erroneous BP value than a small cuff. And if, the, if you can do an auscultatory BP, that is the best way to confirm hypertension in children. This is what our uh, AAP hyper BP charts look like. So they have um, very conveniently laid out the height in centimeters, which can be for the most part done with a quick tape measurement when the child's in bed and conveniently also the 95 plus 12 or the stage two cutoff is given. 
So if the blood pressure is greater than 95 plus 12, this child has stage two hypertension. So a rapid assessment of five key questions to ask the parents for secondary causes of hypertension. The first is a history of kidney disease. Is there any history of kidney disease in the past in this child? Um, the second is to ask for systemic diseases that can present with hypertension, such as lupus, Hinochon lane purpura, diseases that are known to be associated with renal artery stenosis, such as neurofibromatosis, and of course, if the child has had any previous cardiac surgery in the past. Asking for symptoms of kidney disease in case there is no prior history is also important. Of course, symptoms of glomerular disease are easy if the child is having cola colored urine or edema. More important and often missed is a history of recurrent UTIs, which might indicate that the child has a congenital anomaly, um, structural anomaly of the urinary tract or a bladder outlet obstruction, and uh, also symptoms of CKD, such as poor growth, anemia, and recurrent blood transfusions. It's important to ask if the child is taking medications, such as steroids, anything over the counter, um, native medications, because we are not sure exactly what they contain. And of course, we are seeing, especially in uh, urban, you know, um, higher socioeconomic status children, they do have access to drugs as well. And the more last is to rule out a raised intracranial pressure due to an intracranial space occupying lesion or a bleed. So uh, if we were to look at what causes hypertensive crises by age, it's all about the kidney except in infants where coarctation of the aorta must be kept in mind. So renal vascular disease due to renal artery or renal vein thrombus is the most common cause in infants, followed by renal parenchymal disease, not so much glomerular diseases, but um, diseases like autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, um, or sometimes infants with small dysplastic kidneys. Older children, similar to adults, have renal parenchymal disease, such as glomerulonephritis. Um, hemolytic uremic syndrome occurs in children. Um, and of course, CKD, small or scarred kidneys, are an important cause that must be ruled out. Renal artery stenosis does occur. And much less common are coarctation, endocrine causes like pheochromocytomas, and um, intracranial bleeds or trauma. So, this was an exercise that. Um, is meant for the trainees, if there are any over here. Um, so by the clinical findings, very simple history and physical examination, one can often come up with the, at least one or two most likely clinical diagnoses. So the top one, prosimaturia edema, a history of skin, pyodermal skin lesions, and perhaps a obtainable a history of oliguria, points towards acute glomerulonephritis, which is really the commonest cause of hypertensive uh, crisis that we see in our patients. Um, the second um, and the other box highlighted in orange are firstly symptoms of CKD. Now these are easily missed by the family. So just taking a quick look at the child, do they look appropriate size, age, are they pale? Do they have any bony deformities? These are symptoms of CKD in children, which are quite different than the symptoms of CKD in adults. And the second box highlighted in orange is the, it must be stressed that in children with hypertensive crisis, checking a lower limb BP and assessing lower limb pulses is really critical to rule out a coarctation and to look for whether other branches of the aorta may be involved in diseases like vasculitis due to tapiaso arteritis. Um, hemolytic uremic syndrome presents as sudden onset of severe pallor, oliguria, and edema, and with severe hypertension, which is a disease, uh, I think, quite uniquely seen in children. Of course, a child who has ob an obvious malar rash is, that looks like they may be having lupus, and palpable purpura on the legs, which may be suggestive of inoxon in purpura, are other important clues. So this slide just basically um, shows the um, fundus examination of somebody who has severe hypertensive retinopathy. I'm sure you are much more familiar with this than I am. Um, cotton gold spots, blurred optic disc margins, and flame-shaped hemorrhages um, 
even if a child has no, sometimes our patients actually don't complain of visual symptoms and they don't have a headache, but if they have a seizure and we see these findings, then we are sure that it's the hypertension that is likely causing the seizures. So in the evaluation, again, simple tests are usually sufficient. A urine looking for hematuria and proteinuria gives evidence of uh, glomerular disease. Um, creatinine would tell us whether there is any AKI or CKD. A renal ultrasound is important because it tells us whether there are congenital anomalies of the kidney. Um, sometimes children come to us in advanced CKD with really small shrunken kidneys. And until then, until they had symptoms of hypertension, nobody had any idea that they had CKD. The second thing is to look for renal length discrepancy. If one kidney is you know, significantly smaller than the other, then we would think that the smaller kidney is affected by a scar or renal artery stenosis. And of course, we discussed the use of a head CT to rule out a brain tumor and an MRI to confirm press. So let's discuss beginning antihypertensive therapy. So the questions that come up are which route of administration should the antihypertensive drug be given? Which drug should be used? How fast should the blood pressure be lowered? And what should be the treatment blood pressure target? But first, I'm going to sidetrack into the pathophysiology of hypertensive encephalopathy. Um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, the um, normal autoregulation of cerebral blood flow is really within a window where with a rising blood pressure, the cerebral vessels constrict, thereby maintaining a constant cerebral blood flow. And if the blood pressure exceeds this zone of autoregulation, then the blood vessels dilate and then there is um, flooding of the there's endothelial damage and flooding of the brain with um, fluid re resulting in the symptoms. So when there is loss of cerebral autoregulation, there's endothelial damage of the cerebral blood vessels, which leads to a capillary leak and vasogenic edema. And this gives rise to the central nervous system manifestations. And this is the findings of... Um, Press, or what is now known as reversible posterior loop encephalopathy syndrome, which shows a hypodensity in the posterior white matter. And an MRI shows the classic bilateral vasogenic edema in the occipital and sometimes the parietal regions. In children with similar to adults with, a chronic, hyper, with chronic hypertension, this zone of autoregulation is shifted into a region where, of higher blood pressures. And so therefore, similar to adults in children, we would also lower the blood pressure cautiously. So the principles of treating hypertensive emergencies are to rapidly lower the BP so that we reduce the symptoms of end organ damage, but we want a controlled reduction to prevent a sudden fall. And of course, all this has to be done with close blood pressure monitoring. So let's take an example. Um, if we have a 15-year-old child whose systolic blood pressure is 190 millimeters of mercury, and we know, according to the charts, that his 95th centile is 130 millimeters of mercury. So we want to reduce his blood pressure down. That is our end, end goal. In 48 hours, we would like to reduce his blood pressure to 130 millimeters of mercury. So the reduction we are aiming at is 60 millimeters. So in the first eight hours, we would like to reduce the blood pressure by 25% of our targeted reduction. And so 25% of 60 would be 15 millimeters of mercury. And so in the first eight hours, we would like his blood pressure to lower from 190 to 175. In the next 24 to 48 hours, we would like his blood pressure to then come down to the 95th centile. And beyond 48 hours, then we would like to lower it to less than the 95th centile. So this chart essentially shows that in a child with hypertensive emergency, ideally one would use an IV infusion. Whereas those with less severe symptoms or a hypertensive urgency and able to tolerate oral drugs, um, we would try oral medications first. And then if that's not working well enough, try an IV um, infusion or antihypertensive medications. So in the ER, what our best option ideally would be to use an antihypertensive medication, say the beta -law. However, 
in our ER, it often is not available or would take a long time to get. So we use sublingual nifedipine for children. And if you look at, especially um, uh, Western guidelines, they advise against using nifedipine. However, we have many decades of experience with sublingual nifedipine, and we find that it does not um, give rise to the feared um, myocardial complications that sometimes are seen in adults. It lowers the blood pressure quickly, though we don't have really much control over how much is the BP lowers. And it doesn't, the effect of the nifedipine doesn't last very long. It buys us enough time to shift the child into the ICU. Ideally, we would put an intra-arterial line and um, in a child with a hypertensive crisis for IV medications are options available to us at our center. And I think most of India is a sodium nitroprusside or a labetalol infusion. We don't actually have access to nicotine. Um, so we, again, like we discussed, reduce the blood pressure by 25% of the targeted reduction in the first eight hours, and then all the way to the 95th centile over the next 48 hours. After the first eight hours, we add oral antihypertensive drugs and then slowly reduce the IV infusion and stop and watch for a rebound. If there's no rebound um, and the child is okay on oral antihypertensive medications without symptoms, then we shift them to the ward. Um, once the child is in the ward, then we titrate the oral antihypertensives, add on some more and reduce the blood pressure to less than the 95th centile and then really begin our detailed workup for what caused the hypertensive crisis in the first place and then decide on specific therapy. So this is just a chart, an example of how we plan our targeted blood pressure reduction in a child who comes. So what IV medications to use, and I think the most important thing to remember is to use what is available and what um, at your center uh, you are comfortable using. So we um, have sodium nitroprusside as a vasodilator, and uh, it's very effective. We, um, uh, we do require intra-arterial line blood pressure monitoring when we're giving sodium nitroprusside, and we always keep in mind that a, ch a child with a low GFR um, is at risk for thiocyanate toxicity, so we never give it for more than you know, 48 hours. Labetalol is a very um, useful drug with minimal side effects except in a child who's come with frank congestive heart failure. And so we can administer the first bolus in the uh, emergency room or in the ward, and then start an infusion in the ICU. IV hydralazine is a very useful drug, and so is nicardipine. Um, I have used them in, when I practiced in the US, but um, we don't have access to them now. Uh, but nicardipine, I would say, is the one with the least side effect and probably the most uh, effective in children. This is just to show that we in our center have a, a SOP of how to prepare and um, administer the IV infusions so that we make sure we make no mistakes. If anybody would like these, um, I, I'm happy to share the more detailed information if you email me. Uh, um, oral antihypertensive drugs that can be added, uh, as I'm sure you do as well, we often start with amlodipine for its you know, very low side effect profile. Um, we then have access to beta blockers. Metoprolol is our favorite drug to use in kids when we have to add a beta blocker. And um, hydralazine is a very good short acting um, antihypertensive agent for quick blood pressure lowering, but its effect doesn't last more than say, you know, a week, in which case it leads to a more fluid retention. We do use um, medications like prazosin when the first line medications um, haven't lowered the blood pressure enough. Um, we, if the child has chronic kidney disease we are, or a raised creatinine, we are very cautious about adding an ACE inhibitor until we are really sure what has caused the, anti the hypertensive crisis in the first place. So our in-depth evaluation um, for renal artery stenosis, we would begin with a Doppler and then uh, proceed to a CT angiogram. If the CT angiogram is suggestive of a renal artery stenosis, then we would do a proper digital subtraction angiogram. Um, the rest of the workup, I think, is pretty standard. The one thing that we see frequently in our patients are scarred kidneys, either due to dysplasia, uh, congenital dysplasia, or associated with reflux. And so we often 
um, do a DMSA scan to look for parenchymal scars. And sometimes we'll find the scars and then do a VCUG and discover the reflux later. So I'm going to stop in here and just um, check in um, with um, you all and see how much time I have left. And then we could maybe do one or two cases. Well, we have we have enough time. OK. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, all right. So there, here are some clinical scenarios of cases that we've uh, seen recently or that we commonly see. So this is a eight-year-old boy who was previously healthy but he presented to us with generalized swelling for three days and a headache for one day. And now he is lethargic, he's not eating well, and his parents say his urine looks dark. And his blood pressure was 140 by 90, and he was edematous on examination. So um, I'll read out our options here. I know that I won't ask you to answer this, but in, what do you think is the most useful diagnostic test in this patient? Would you do a serum creatinine and urea that would lead you to the diagnosis, an ABG to look for metabolic acidosis, an ECG to look for tall T waves suggestive of hyperkalemia, or a simple urine for routine and microscopy. And if you answered number four urine, you would be right. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with what an RBC cast looks like. This is one of them. And we actually have a microscope in our ward and as well as a centrifuge. And we find that this is very useful because our lab invariably, by the time they process the urine, never find a cast. Uh, but when we centrifuge and look at fresh urine, we do identify our BC casts. And of course, if they're dysmorphic, then that leads us to the diagnosis of acute glomerulonephritis. So based on this child's diagnosis, what is the most useful additional drug to treat this patient's hypertension? Is it atenolol, enalapril, amlodipine, or a loop diuretic furosemide? And so when we look at the pathophysiology of acute, our patients mostly have post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And so the pathophysiology of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis essentially as you can see here is a state of, sorry, that's moving in its own, is essentially in simply salt and water retention, resulting in hypertension, which also results in the edema. And so the first and best drug for acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is to give them a loop diuretic. And that's usually what, um, after we've stabilized them and controlled their seizures, is to administer a quick IV lasics and um, once they diurese, then their blood pressure significantly improves. And most of the time, we don't need to add any other oral antihypertensive agents until their glomerulonephritis resolves. Case two is a 10-year-old boy who's not been growing well. Um, he has no symptoms of oliguria, hematuria, edema. His blood pressure is 160 by 100 in the arm. 170 by 105 in his leg, and he has absolutely no symptoms. So his diagnosis is a hypertensive urgency because his blood pressure is severely enough elevated to have the potential to cause target organ damage. So he has hypertensive urgency despite having no symptoms. And so, of course, the quickest way for us to evaluate for target organ damage that we can't assessed by just a simple clinical examination of the CVS or CNS is to do a fundus. And of course, here he has the fundus evidence of severe hypertensive retinopathy. So I think the take-home message for a child who presents with a hypertensive crisis is to think nine times out of 10, sometimes 10 times out of 10, they have kidney disease. So in this patient, he had urine show 2 plus albumin. He had no RBCs. His creatinine was 1.8. But according to the estimated GFR, it was only 35 ml per minute. And so um, we were suspicious that he might have either acute or chronic kidney disease. And if this child has not grown well and has suspected chronic hypertension, he most likely has CKD. So a quick ultrasound revealed echogenic small kidneys. So our diagnosis was chronic kidney disease, most likely due to hypodysplasia, but 
posterior urethral valves and other cacot has to be ruled out and he has stage 2 hypertension. So very briefly, as is very similar to all adult patients with CKD, hypertension in CKD is multifactorial and often requires multiple drugs to control. So the question would be, what is the best first choice of antihypertensive medication in this asymptomatic child? Would it be oral amlodipine, IV labetalol, sublingual nifedipine, or oral inalapril? And I think if we were to walk through these choices, the, the approach to this patient, since he's asymptomatic and suspected to have chronic hypertension, would be not to lower his blood pressure too rapidly, as well as not lower his GFR too significantly. And so therefore, I would admit this child to the PICU for blood pressure monitoring, but start with an oral antihypertensive medication such as amlodipine. If the BP doesn't improve, then I would start him on an IV labetalol um, infusion and then transition that to an oral beta blocker. And because his GFR is so close to the 30 mark, I would avoid ACE inhibitors until his serum creatinine stabilizes. Of course, keeping in mind that if he has CKD, then and the CKD is um, you know, not too advanced, then an ACE inhibitor would be the drug of choice um, for him ultimately. So if he's still hypertensive after amlodipine, these are all the various medications that we use um, you know, in increasing order of rarity. So we use calcium channel blockers in children, beta blockers, then we move on to alpha blockade with drugs like prazosin, hydralazine. We do use clonidine, but um, it causes a lot of drowsiness in children and it causes rebound when it is suddenly stopped. But its advantage is that it's not removed by dialysis. So in patients on dialysis, it's a useful drug. And finally, when we are pushed against the wall and we really you know, can't control the child's hypertension, we do use minoxidil and it's very effective. We often end up using it for maybe a week or two and then are able to reduce it and stop it. So this is the last case. This is a 12-year-old girl who presented with seizures to the emergency room. She had a history of headaches for one week, normal urine output. Her blood pressure, as you can see, was 220 by 130 um, persistently, and therefore her blood pressure was really very high. So what would you think would be her diagnosis? She has hypertension plus symptoms. So her diagnosis immediately would be hypertensive emergency. What are the differential diagnoses? So we began an evaluation after starting antihypertensive therapy. Her urine was normal, her creatinine was minimally elevated, but her renal ultrasound showed that she had a renal length discrepancy. The left kidney was two centimeters larger than the right. So what is the differential diagnosis for a small kidney? That would be dysplasia, scarring, or renal artery stenosis. So when we are thinking of renal artery stenosis, an ultrasound with a Doppler is very specific, but it is poorly sensitive, whereas an angiography with an MRI or CT angiogram is far more sensitive. And so this would be, if I had to rule out renal artery stenosis, this is the test that I would do. So um, just briefly, if you only have access to a Doppler, this is a normal Doppler wave pattern with a sharp rise in, um, and a high peak. Whereas in a, child, a person with renal artery stenosis, they have the classic power stardust pattern with diminished amplitude and slow rising of the peak velocity. So this child um, ended up having an MR angiogram, which as you can see, shows a right renal artery stenosis. And uh, this is a video that shows stenting that I'm going to uh, skip actually. So basically in a child who has renal artery stenosis, what we would do, um, is the first and most important thing is to rule out whether the child has Takayasu arteritis <clears throat> um, by looking for signs of inflammation or symptoms of inflammation, fever, weight loss, etc. And if they have no such symptoms, um, we would intervene by doing a balloon angioplasty and um, if required, placing a stent as well. Meant to stop that. Let's see if we proceed. Okay. So uh, a brief word, I'm not sure if you see Takayasu arthritis, we do. They can sometimes present with fever, weight loss, and there is a 
theoretical association with tuberculosis that has not been really proven. Takayasu arthritis can involve multiple branches of the aorta, and so they can present with absent or feeble limb pulses. Um, so it's important to check the blood pressure in the lower limbs. And when we suspect Takayasu arthritis, we do angiography of all the aortic branches, including the uh, branches of the arch supplying the brain, as well as the abdominal aorta. And if the disease is active, then we give the child um, six weeks of immunosuppression before attempting any stenting or angioplasty to open the renal artery stenosis. So um, take home messages um, from this session would be that a hypertensive crisis is an acute severe elevation of blood pressure. Um, if the child has symptoms, then it's a hypertensive emergency. Without symptoms, but an acute severe elevation would char be characterized as an hypertensive urgency. The severity of the blood pressure elevation, as well as the rate of rise, somebody whose blood pressure has suddenly risen, even if it is not very severely elevated, is more likely to have symptoms than a child who has had hypertension for years. Um, in pediatrics, it's almost always important to look for a secondary cause of hypertension, and kidney disease is the most frequent cause of hypertensive crises in children. When to manage a hypertensive emergency, it's important to lower the blood pressure quickly, though in a controlled fashion. And if you have access to IV medications, that would be ideal, though if it is important to not wait too long before lowering the blood pressure, and so therefore. Um, nifedipine um, is very effective at quickly lowering the blood pressure. After in therapy is initiated, then it's important to confirm, evaluate, and treat the cause of the hypertensive crisis in that child. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Priya. That was very insightful for many of us who deal with adults all the time. Uh, we have uh, quite a few pediatric nephrologists attending this webinar. and. Uh, I would really appreciate if uh, anybody had a question or a remark for Dr. Priya to probably raise their hands or use the chat boxes, the Q&A chat box and the regular chat box to post your question. In the meantime, I would request uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Francis Furia, who is the consultant nephrologist, pediatric nephrologist and rheumatologist at the Moimbili National Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, to, to start us off with the, with the remarks. Professor Francis, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Amma, and, and thank you, Dr. Priya, for uh, this interesting talk. Um, I think it is um, very, very clear, and you've taken us through the process that we are, I mean, the steps that we need to take when you are stabilizing the patient. And I, I completely agree with you that most of the times when we have uh, hypertension, agents and emergence, usually the kidneys are involved. And uh, it's true, we, we have seen patients with Takayasu arthritis, and uh, it is very easy to miss them. And mm -hmm. usually I try to, I, I usually tell my colleagues that if you are evaluating any patient with hypertension, please remember to just feel all the pulses. Try to feel all the pulses. If some are missing, probably you're dealing with Takayasu arthritis. And then I've, 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 I've missed quite a few patients because of that. Um, just not examining the pulse, and, um, and and it is very useful just picking up the pulse, and then you can take the subsequent evaluations. And uh, of course, uh, we have access to labetalol intravenous in the in the in the tertiary level of care in the in the big consultant hospitals. And I want to believe that nifedipine might be available in most of the centers, and that could be useful for some of these patients. And at times, we might be only having hydralazine, and I guess hydralazine can also do if, we, if that's the only option that you have. And, uh, but uh, it could be cumbersome if you're using it. It is not as uh, uh, user-friendly in, in terms of administration as, as labetalol, as uh, Dr. Priya has alluded to. So thank you so much for this talk, Santi. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Yes, we don't have access to IV hydralazine, but I think that if you do, that is actually, it works really well um, to bring the blood pressure down. Um, oral hydralazine is what we have, and it's okay um, at lowering the blood pressure. It's not bad. Thank you, Professor Francis. Uh, while we're waiting for other comments, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Lloyd uh, to comment. I think, uh, I think thank you very much, Priya. That is a wonderful 
uh, talk and it is very, very clearly put and very, uh, you know, very uh, educative, uh, a, a great reminder of so many things that we oversee, uh, especially as uh, Dr. Francis pointed out in the examining the pulses. But I think a very, very important point that uh, we see in the West, but, you know, we don't see uh, on our side, and which you have actually brought into the unit is the uh, examination of the urine. And, and that is a very, very key factor that means it must be brought into the ward. And, and quite often uh, it goes into the lab, urine going into the lab, as you rightly pointed out, you see, we, the, the casts are missed. Definitely the casts are missed. And not only that, the second aspect is if we actually do the urine uh, in the ward, the fellows and the residents and in the interns, all of them learn how to do a urine evaluation, which is extremely, extremely important. The most important test is there proteinuria? Is, is there, uh, is there, are there uh, casts? What are the types of casts? And RBC casts is a sign known for a glomerular disease, a glo acute glomerular nephritis. And then looking at a glomerular RBC cast. And this is something actually uh, I had really not done uh, in India. It was always in the lab. And this is when I went into Toronto that uh, my mm -hmm. professor, uh, you know, uh, in, in Toronto, Dr. Bagman, he, she would always, always ask, uh, for the urine as the first diagnostic test and then the clinical diagnostic test. And that is something, so it became practice that we would always take the urine when we go for a clinical evaluation, history examination and urine from the patient, then go into the department, uh, spin, the, spin the urine, yeah. 3000 revolutions per minute, uh, throw out the supernatant, take the sediment, put it on a, on a slide, put a cover slip over, look at the urine and go with the urine report to the consultant to discuss the case. So that's a very, very important point, Dr. Priya, and extremely grateful for that important, you know, uh, thing that you do. Thank you. That was part of my training too. And so yeah. um, it's, uh, I think an RBC cast is not so difficult to find, but yeah. um, I remember my professor in the US also teaching me how to recognize an ATN cast, which I think is far more difficult. So it's yes. very useful. Yes, thank you for bringing that up also. The, the muddy bone cast, the heme, <laughs> they call the heme granular cast. <laughs> yeah, that was another thing for any AKI, any AKI, just take the urine. You don't need creatinine, I'm telling you. Just take the urine, spin it, take it down and, and, and look at uh, on a, uh, under the car slip and you'll see it immediately, you'll see it. If it's a florid AKI, you'll see it. But if it's like a doubtful thing, you'll still see cars if you really look for them. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Lloyd. So Dr. Prasad, uh, Dr. Prakash Gutsurkar has a question. Welcome, Dr. Prakash. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Priya, an excellent talk. Being being an adult nephrologist, I, I'm, a, I'm based in Cincinnati, and okay. uh, we, we never encounter the pediatric part of the management, but it's, it's such an excellent overview um, going through individual D, because most of these disease entities we hardly see as adult nephrologists, because the most common cause of Accelerated hypertension for us in our setting is probably just patients not taking their medications chronically. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's an excellent uh, overview. Um, part of my, uh, I would have a comment and a question for you both. So um, my one of my major chunk of practice is onconephrology. So um, I, I collaborate with my pediatric hospital in Children's Cincinnati Hospital, uh, and we I do see patients coming in to me with. Not in not an end organ damage per se, but severe accelerated hypertension even in the clinic, especially when they get their uh, infusions of VEGF inhibitors, uh, Avastin, mm -hmm. or certain types of cancers or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Do you have any specific insights? We, you know, in adults there is no particular guideline, um, and we we just randomly give some medications to bring that blood pressure down acutely. But do you have any specific insights or any? Uh, things uh, specific things for pediatric standpoint to treat these drug induced hypertensions, especially the cancer uh, targeted therapy. So um, I will say straight off that um, we do have uh, quite a large ped onco center here, but I don't think they are using much of the VEGF inhibitors, and I believe that they cause thrombotic microangiopathy or endothelial damage and therefore like a, I guess an HUS type of picture. Um, so I, I don't know, I've not managed those patients. So I can't really speak from practical experience. Um, 
what we do see is children, you know, bone marrow transplant um, who very frequently get hypertension. Um, we have seen CNI, calcium inhibitor associated uh, thrombotic microangiopathy and they get quite severe hypertension. Um, if they don't have AKI, I think ACE inhibitors are a good drug. Otherwise, we often just start with, with you know, the safest and simplest calcium channel blockers because they work well for um, calcineurin inhibitor induced hypertension and then um, scale it up from there. I agree. I mean, um, I, 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 we have been probably doing the same strategy. Only thing is that we have an option of using what we, uh, for inpatient we use, we use nicardipin infusion. Uh, probably you might have used what during your training in US. Um, yeah. Nicardipin yeah. actually prob yeah. and probably is not available in India. Uh, but it 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 helps us just to get get over the crisis period. But um, that's that's we, uh, we use um, SN so nitroprusside and that um, I think so um, I had never used it in the US, but we use it a lot um, at our center because we don't have nicotine. It's very effective. Um, we just because we are unable to measure thiocyanate levels we make sure that they are able to get off of it within 48 hours or so it works it works really well but um, of course has a not so great toxicity profile compared to nicotine thank you dr p thank you thank you dr prakash and uh, we've had a comment uh requesting for your slides for this presentation. So we were wondering if you'd be happy to share it with us, Dr. Priya. Yeah, that, that should be fine. I will send them to um, yeah. Dr. I, Lloyd. I will, yeah. yeah, yeah, I will distribute them. I will send it across the board to everyone, not an issue. If, uh, is that okay, Dr. Priya? I'll be sending it across to the whole mailing list. It'll go across. Um, I, what I can do is send them across PDF. as a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, PDF. Yeah. Sure. There is one I have to confess that when I look through my slides, there is a mistake in the um, sodium nitroprusside infusion rate. So um, I think anyway, when it comes to drug infusions, um, I think I wrote it as mic mics per minute instead of mics per kg per minute. So I think that I would request everybody to look at their drug dosage handbook and dose yeah. that correctly. So we will also be posting a recording of this talk on YouTube on the channel Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. So everybody could just log on to the channel and uh, subscribe and you will have access to the weekly videos. The other 108 videos are up on the channel as well. And this one should be out by Monday. I would like to thank Dr. Priya for taking time out once again to join us and giving us this excellent talk. And I hope, like I said earlier, that you will join us for a few more talks in, in, in the coming days. I would like to request Dr. Lloyd to give the closing remarks and the vote of thanks to Dr. Priya for this evening's talk. Dr. Lloyd. Thank you so much, uh, Priya. It was a wonderful session. As I said, it's very clear cut and, you know, and very practical. That is the most important thing. And, and, and looking at the scenario in, in the developing world on the low resource settings, and that is what is important because most often we can't use what is in the West in our sort of setting, and and uh, and that was uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, and of course, uh, also thank thanks to Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Frederick uh, Fura and uh, Prakash uh, coming in with questions and discussions. And the cases, especially, were uh, extremely interesting and very practical uh, to the point, which is very important out on this side. The uh, again, I would stress on the importance of looking into the urine in the ward itself, not sending that sample to the lab. So, with all this uh, this wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Priya, extremely grateful for the time, and I'm sure it's very late out there. And this will continue to be on YouTube, so I think all of us will benefit from this. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.